ladies and gentlemen, both at home and in our studio audience, and welcome to the HCAM and Hopkinton Independent 2018 Contested Races Candidates Debates. I'm HCAM News Director Tom Nappy, and I will be the moderator for tonight's debates. This evening, we will hear from candidates and the five contested races in this year's town election. Our panelists this evening include Michelle Murdoch and Jim Kleinkoff from the Hopkinton Independent, as well as myself, Tom Nappy. Our format for these debates is simple. We will alternate asking each candidate questions, and they will have up to one minute to respond. If you hear the bell, you have 10 seconds remaining. If a candidate has a follow-up response to another candidate's comment, they can state they would like to make an additional comment. I will cue them, and the candidate will have 30 seconds for the comment. A panelist may ask a follow-up question, and the candidate will have up to one minute to respond. Following the question and answers, each candidate will have up to two minutes each for a closing statement. Our first contested races candidates debate features candidates for the Board of Health and Board of Library Trustees. Questions for this debate will be asked by Jim Kleinkoff and myself. We have our Board of Library Trustees candidates, Ms. Nanette Kenrick and Mr. Stanley Polnick, and also Board of Health candidate, Mr. Michael King. The other Board of Health candidate, Mr. Rick Jacobs, was invited but unfortunately unable to make tonight's debate. There is one open seat for the Board of Library Trustees and one open seat for the Board of Health. Before we start, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to participate this evening. Our first question is for the Board of Library Trustees. What's the role of the Board of Library Trustees and why are you running? We'll start off with Nanette. Okay, I, I feel that the Board of Library Trustees is like um, the mother and father of a family. They teach us to turn off the lights and preserve the electricity. They check that our library is clean and neat. They give out allowance money for each department in person. They decide the grocery list of problems and um, situations that they need to report, someone, have someone report on. Um, they worry about the future of the library, especially as it affects the patrons. Questions um, about what is the future of the book? What magazines appeal to the public? What kind of employees shall we employ and what is their job description? How many people attended such and such seminars? And the second part of the question is why I decided to run? Yes. Okay, I spent more than 17 years in the library business. Other years I was an ordinary worker, key punching, typing, writing reports, executing marketing plans, and volunteering. I volunteered to teach adults to read through the Framingham Public Library. I volunteered in an inner city school to teach reading in Framingham. I volunteered at my church at St. Paul's here in Hoppington to take the minutes of the vestry. I volunteered to get software for the MDs at the hospital where I worked. Am I done? You could uh, continue on for a little bit longer. Volunteering to teach the mentally retarded and mentally how to work at a job. Volunteering to work as a team member of the alumni to raise $10,000 for a scholarship for Worcester State College. Um, I've been an idea person all my life, and I'd like to share my ideas with the library trustees. All right, thank you. And just take the bell as a bit of a warning that time is running out. <laughs> okay. But usually I'll let you continue on for a little bit longer. Uh, Stanley, uh, same question. Can you explain the role of the Board of Library Trustees and why you're running? Well, the, the role of the trustees is largely an advisory role. Um, we work with the director on her budget, and we, you know, we advise. We, you know, you got to take a piece here. You got to put put it back over there. You know, uh, we don't have a whole lot of budget to work with in the library. And so when she does her budget, it's very critical to get input from four or five other people to make sure the money's going where it really will do the most good. Um, we also make public appearances on behalf of the library. Uh, we attend a lot of functions. One thing I wasn't aware of until today when one of my friends pointed it out to me was uh, when they had the grand opening 
reopening of the library last October. The uh, trustees planned that whole thing, and they did a great job. They, I mean, right down to the catering, they, they did that. So I was very impressed with it. I'm, I'm running because the library is my passion. I've been a volunteer there for about 10 or 12 years. I'm a member of the uh, Friends of the Library. I've been working with them for the last month or so um, on getting ready for the book sale, which is a big fundraiser for them. And uh, it's a way I can put something back into the community. Um, it's just my thing. All right, thank you very much. All right, Jim has our next question for our Board of Health candidate here with us today, Mr. Michael James King. Uh, Jim, can you uh, please ask the next question? Did you say for health, or are we still on the library? Right here. Oh, okay, very good. All right, what qualifies you for the Board of Health? Um, so the Board of Health is responsible for overseeing the um, health and safety of the town, as well as uh, sound environmental policies. Um, so professionally, I'm a process development scientist. I'm responsible for um, coming up with the manufacturing processes for pharmaceuticals. Um, and in that job, I've been exposed to several um, environmental health and safety policies, and I've had to interact with several regulatory agencies. Um, it also kind of gave me a mindset to solve um, open-ended problems. So I think that's served me well in my past year on the Board of Health. All right, Mr. King, the uh, next question is also for you. Sure. Uh, what is your stance on banning plastic bags from retail and grocery stores, and why? Um, so I actually could not go to that hearing because my daughter was born that night, um, but I voted in favor uh, of all the uh, steps leading up to that. Um, so I would be in favor of banning plastic bags, single-use plastic bags in stores. Can you talk a bit about why? Um, it's just kind of like a blight on society. Um, you can't recycle them, first of all. It actually even says it on our trash barrels in town because they jam up the single-stream recycling. Um, it's made out of a uh, polymer called polyethylene. It doesn't biodegrade, so it stays in the environment forever. And then also, um, when they get into the street, they can cause flooding, and that's a big municipal issue. So. All right, thank you. Yep. Our next question is for the Board of Library Trustees candidates. Jim, you have the next question. Can you please talk about some of the upcoming priorities for the Board of Library Trustees? Why don't we start with uh, Stanley this time? Priorities. Well, I've been fortunate enough to be able to attend the last three or four meetings of the trustees, and they are working with the director on a survey that everybody in town is going to be able to participate in if they wish. And it's about library usage. What can we do to make things better, easier, more accessible, all of that stuff. Um, there are a lot of things that we haven't been able to do in the past strictly because of this, the limited space we had in the old building. Now we have more room. We can bring in more programs um, that are not only educational but entertaining and stuff like that. Um, we want the library to be, in the future, more of a community center um, than it has been in the past. You know, we got the space now, so let's make, take advantage of it. All right, Nanette. Thank you. Well, this is the time when you need to experiment. You spent um, years trying to get this big, large in, um, development of a library that is good for the public. Now is the time for them to experiment on different types of um, programming that they can offer, what kinds of books they can offer, what new modern computer systems they can offer. And um, I can't be specific about what they are doing to do because I don't, I don't haven't been to a library trustee meeting. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question is for our Board of Health candidate. Uh, what is your stance on recreational marijuana? Um, meaning the stance on having it in town or just my stance in general? Uh, I guess both, stance in general and stance in town. I mean, I'm not opposed to recreational marijuana. I would not like having it in the town you know i definitely don't think it would be a good idea to have you know pot shops in town um for marijuana in hawkington i'd prefer that it be designated for medical use okay thank you uh jim you have our next question for the board of library trustees candidates yeah let's start with annette 
What, um, well, do you think the library is doing enough to promote itself? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I think that um, initially when they had the grand opening, a lot of people signed up for library cards. And since then, I've been in the library quite a number of times. The computers are not being used. And I don't see the crowds in the library that, that you see in, say, Framingham Public or Southboro Public. And um, I would be concerned if I was the librarian about how she can offer programming that will meet the needs of the town. Bring in more people by being open better hours or uh, bring in more people by opening, opening better hours. Is what I would primarily would be my concern. All right. Thank you. Stan. You know, um, I, I don't have the numbers with me, but I saw the numbers on how much more traffic there has been and how much more usage there has been and how much, how many more people have applied for library cards um, since the library opened. And, and it's ridiculous. It's, it's like up 160% in some places, up 140% in other areas. Um, the teen usage, the young adult area that they have in there, usage of that is up. Um, they have the study rooms downstairs, and every time I've been in there on Saturdays, people are using them. Um, when I go in there on Monday night, and when I go in, you know, sometimes on Wednesday, there are people using those computers upstairs and downstairs. Um, yeah, the library can always use promotion. Um, people think of the library as a book repository, and it's so much more than that. The libraries, libraries aren't dead. They're just changing shape and changing their function within the community. I want to be part of that. I'm going to follow up with a quick question. What was Part of what was in my mind when I came up with this question was the fact that recently there was a book signing by Dave McGilvery, very poorly attended. Um, I'm there was wondering. Also, a, um, a seminar on uh, Roosevelt, and only people from the Hopkinton Historical Society attended it. Uh, there were no, there were no other people there. There was five people there, so um, they they need to tailor the needs and the uh, the interests of the community to what they're offering. Um, I disagree with um, Stan that. Um, their statistics are up, not necessarily. It was just such a small place before that now that it's a big place, it naturally is going to go up and because there's more people coming to this big space. Um, I don't think it necessarily means that they are doing a good job. Stanley? I think they're doing a good job. I, th I think that when it comes to programs, <coughs> Some things are geared towards a specific audience, um, and you can't expect huge amounts of attendance for some things that are basically historical. Um, like you said, most of the people there were from the Historical Society. Yes, they were. Um, you know, Carter Allen did a thing up there and banged the place out, so it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Um, they're using Facebook, they're using um, their own library website to promote things like this and uh, they're looking at other ways you know to promote events like that it's a question of are the right people seeing them at the right time like I said before this is an experimental time for them it, some things are going to fail and some things are going to succeed so it's you can't judge the library on a whole as for what's going on at this particular time in the the uh, lifetime of the library. Um, they've got to experiment. Thank you both. All right. Thank you very much. Our next question is for our Board of Health candidate here with us today, Mr. King. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your stance on the tobacco age increase from 18 to 21 and why? Um, so I supported raising it to 21 as well. Um, I think that tobacco has uh, very little merit for society. Um, and then on the back end, you know, it ends up costing us all a lot of money because the way our health care system is set up in the United States. So, you know, I support raising it to 21. I supported raising it to 21. Okay. Our next question is also for our Board of Health candidate, Mr. King. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, Jim, you have the next question. I do. In addition to tobacco, um, the Board of Health decided to regulate non-tobacco nicotine delivery products such as electronic cigarettes, nicotine vaporizers. Um, what's your take on that and why? Uh, I think it's an important thing actually if you're going to raise it to 21 because at the high school um, the vaporizers are more prevalent now than cigarettes and you know traditional tobacco products so if you really want to affect that demographic you have to ban the jewels and the vaporizers and those e-cigarette products. Thank you very much. And that will wrap up the question portion of this debate. It is now time for closing statements. Each of you will have up to two minutes to make a closing statement. Uh, we'll start off with our Board of Library Trustees candidates, and we will start off with Stanley. Well, the library, as we used to know it when I was a kid growing up, no longer exists. Um, a lot of people say libraries are dead, and yet they're actually more vibrant than they were when I was a kid growing up. It's become a community center. It's become a place where you can go and be educated and entertained in a, in a time when the President of the United States talks about fake news, where you can go in there and get different viewpoints from different magazines, different websites, um, different papers. Um, there's an educational element um, to the programming in there now that there wasn't before. Um, we're, we're getting some more feedback and usage from our ever-growing Chinese population. Um, a couple of weeks ago on a Friday night, they, had a, they took the big room and they had a poetry reading in there. I thought that was a pretty cool use of the library. Um, we, we have, have talked in the past about, you know, there are English uh, as a second language programs galore. Well, maybe we should start going the other way. How about Mandarin being taught to some of us or Hindi? You know, we, we're, we have to change with the demographic. And um, one of the things that I really like is that the young adult area and the young adult librarian, she's, she's an electric person. She's really cool. And she's got these kids coming into the library in record numbers. And the, I encourage that, you know. It, it, it's just uh, phenomenal what she's done in there. And that, that room is a very special room. The, the kids really have gravitated to it. It's little things like that. As Nan says, it's an experiment. It's an ongoing experiment. The town is changing. The demographic is changing. The library has to change to keep up with that and be relevant and be a big part of it. Okay, Nanette? Well, um, I think I should talk about why my background would be good for a library trustee. I've served on three board of director positions. Um, I worked for Literacy Incorporated, at, which is part of the Framingham Public Library. I taught adults to read. After two years, I was promoted to the board of directors because I was so sensational in that job. Um, I learned quite a lot about uh, how um, the committee worked with the public library. I also served as an administrator for Middlesex Conservation District. Uh, I reported to the Board of Supervisors and I took minutes for them. And I went to their meetings and I have an idea of how that kind of board works. Um, I'm currently on the board of directors for the Hoppington Historical Society. And um, I uh, know after five years quite a lot about what happens in, in among the board of directors. I, I think I would be a good candidate. I have a little grant work. Um, I wrote a, um, a grant for St. Andrew's Church for a bird and butterfly garden. I wrote a grant for the Hoppington Historical Society from the American Library Association for a uh, future of the library. And um, I have a little experience with non-nationals uh, by working with ESL at the Framingham Public Library. All right, thank you very much. And now uh, 
We'll give our uh, Board of Health candidate with us today two minutes for a closing statement. Mr. King. Sure. Uh, so I enjoyed immensely serving on the Board of Health over the past year, and um, I think we had an incredibly productive year. Um, so we hired the new health director. Um, we passed two important regulations to help ensure the health and safety of the town, the plastic bag ban and the raising of the tobacco age. Um, I kind of feel like we're just getting started. Um, we have a lot of exciting things that are ongoing right now, and I would very much appreciate being reelected. So I'll ask that people vote for me on May 21st. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, thank you all very much for coming today. Greatly appreciate it. And uh, that will do it for the first portion of our Hopkinton Town Election Contested Races Candidates Debate. We're going to take about a two-minute break. When we come back, we will hear from our school committee candidates. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more debate on HCAM. This week on HCAM, the yeah. EHOP Spotlight Series continues so those, those by getting us ready for town meeting with Know Your Vote. What we're talking about on these slides. Um, and then a turf field project is part of a capital budget, and there are several different ways that those can be funded. Um, this year the determination was made that um, if this is approved at, at town meeting it would be funded within the levy limit that's not within the school operating budget hello and welcome back to the hcam candidates contested races debate for our next contested races debate we have two of the three candidates for school committee miss amanda fargiano and miss meg tyler the other candidate, Ms. Kristen Dystra, was invited, but unfortunately unable to make tonight's debate. There are two open seats for school committee. Before we start, I would just like to thank you both for taking the time to be here today. All right, so for our first question, that is me. So uh, what do you feel is the top three challenges facing the school committee over the next five years. We'll start off with Amanda and each of you will have a minute to answer the questions. Okay. Well, I think the first challenge, uh, if anyone has follow been following the budget from this year, is the growth in town and the demand that it is putting on our services that we're offering in our schools. Um, from, I think, October to March this year, 57 new students joined our schools. I think um, 19 of them were English language learners. We have um, an influx of special education um, needs as well. And it is a challenge, especially when that happens in the middle of a school year, in the middle of a budget cycle, to address um, the influx of new students. Uh, so that's certainly top for me. Um, I believe that we have a challenge, and I, as I, I think I mentioned in the candidates tonight, we're going to be going into the strategic planning. Um, and for me, um, one of the elements that I'd like to fold into our future looking strategic plan is how we uh, address STEM education uh, effectively, K through 12. Um, so I, you know, I won't get into de details now, but that's important to me. Um, third top issue, oh gosh, there are several. Um, I think sort of going off the growth, I think um, diversity and inclusion is important to me. Um, we have all sorts of new faces coming into town. I love seeing the diversity, and I think we need to work very hard at integrating all of our um, all of our citizens into our schools and parents and children, so that we can really uh, be one town. So those are my top three. Okay, Meg. I think my answer is complementary to Amanda's because I think with the increasing growth in the town, we face a number of challenges. Next year in the Hopkins School, I think we have 22 or 23 students in each classroom. Um, I think it makes that challenging for both teachers and students to get the most out of that kind of fraught environment with wriggling bodies and wild imaginations. Um, I think we're also a little bit tight on space. We can't create new classrooms at Elmwood without investing more money. Um, over the next several years to try to improve the buildings so we can house more students in them. Um, I'm concerned too about finding ways to better incorporate students from diverse backgrounds with different language skills and capacities into the school system, um, as well as incorporating and integrating an increasing number of students with disabilities. 
Um, autism is on the rise, that's no surprise. Learning disabilities are being diagnosed at a higher rate than before. And do we have the services and the supports right now to do it? Thank you very much. For our next question, we'll send it over to Michelle Murdoch from the Hopkins Independent. Okay, um, the next question is budget related. Uh, the, the budget process this year was particularly challenging. And in the end, while it was reconciled and balanced, the school committee was asked to amend and ultimately reduce the voted and adopted superintendent's recommended budget. So over the past couple of years, uh, there's been a switch from what happened further back in terms of combining the two budgets into one article at town meeting. And uh, my question is, do you feel that combining the town and the school budgets into one warrant article, rather than separate, did it help or hurt the budget process this year? Meg, you may answer first. I think it confounded us all, combining them into one article like that. Um, I think that there's so much going on in the schools and half the town budget goes over to the schools. That $45 million needs to be puzzled over by a group of people who are working closely together um, I sometimes feel like the school committee and the board of selectmen represent the two different tribes in town who speak different languages. Um, and I do think that they, they, in the end, came to a kind of happy compromise, um, but they're not smiling as much as I would like them to do, and we've had positions cut. Um, buildings and grounds improvements won't be made for a while because we had to take those out of the budget. Um, we have a parking lot, a bus parking lot to build. Uh, I think that there are so many elements of the school committee, committee's concerns that require our time and focus. And to conflate the two is probably not in our best interest. All right, Amanda. I um, completely agree. I mean, uh, I've tracked the budget process in the past at 50,000 feet, but this year, um, particularly preparing for this candidacy, I was in the details, in the weeds, and it was complex. It was very difficult to, um, to follow the process as a combined budget. That said, um, I do respect the fact that as a combined budget, the Board of Selectmen and the school committee really keep all citizens in mind when they're looking at overall cost to the, to the residents. And so while it was painful um, and a little bit uh, disjointed at times, I, th I think that I can see that it does serve all citizens to, to keep it under one umbrella. Um, what's challenging, I think, is that the process that the school committee uses is not is, is its own process. I found it to be fairly easy to follow. I'm not as familiar with the process the Board of Selectmen used, so I felt it was a little bit difficult to compare apples and apples when we're looking at making cuts. When we're talking about maybe a fifth grade music program, how does that compare to sidewalks? I, I couldn't quite get all the pieces myself um, on the table at the same time to really understand it, but I do understand why one number does represent um, the impact to all residents a little bit more clearly. Okay, um, we're gonna go next with a, another budget-related question. What is the role of the school committee in the budget process overall? So for instance, how involved are the committee members compared to say the school superintendent, the teachers, the school finance director, you know, in deciding sort of priorities, what you're gonna focus on and that type of thing? We'll have Amanda answer first. Um, as far as I understand it, the way I understand it, I believe that um, the school committee is integral but um, somewhat advisory. I think that a lot of the priorities are set by the strategic plan at the, at the highest level, especially when resources get tight. Um, and the superintendent works very hard with the principals to build a zero-based budget and to look forward uh, developing school improvement plans that align with the strategic plan and then investments that support those um, objectives. That then comes to the school committee to assess and evaluate and make sure that the needs of the town are being met. Um, and I think the school committee um, in the past has asked questions, challenged some of the assumptions maybe that have been in that first pass of the budget. Um, and that's 
you know, an important role for all of us, the five of us, to bring our own priorities and our own unique experiences to the table to look out for the needs of um, disabled children and to look out for the needs of advanced learners and to look out for the needs of um, English language learners and make sure that we're not um, cutting out programs that, that are going to impact our, our kids when they're in classes. I agree that the school committee's role is advisory. I mean, the school committee is in charge of helping to hire the superintendent and to oversee her or his work. Um, but I think in that hiring process, there's invested a certain amount of trust in that person to make good decisions on behalf of both the teachers and the students involved. I think we're very lucky right now to have Dr. Cavanaugh at the helm um, and I already work with her with some business with CPAC. Um, and I look forward to working with her more because I find her very considerate and thoughtful. She's not hasty in her decision making. I think part of the school committee's job is to absorb the concerns and the interests of the townspeople. We're here to help give those parents and students a voice. Um, sometimes our interests with the administration will coincide and sometimes they won't. Um, but I do look forward to those moments of negotiation and, and compromise with each other. Mrs. Rothenbich has um, brought a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge, I think, to the financial role, which I think for me is encouraging as we look forward to stepping into school committee and knowing that we have her as a professional advisor who seems to bring a, a lot to the table. So I've okay, all right, thank you. How important is the school system to the economic welfare of the town? I oh. think, oh, Sorry. my turn? Yes, your yeah. turn. Sorry. I think that Hopkins 10 invests a lot of energy in showcasing its school system. I think we're third in the US news ranking. Um, I think that's based on the results of standardized tests. And I have very mixed feelings about basing such a ranking on standardized tests and supposed college preparation. Um, but I know we attract a lot of people to this town because of the school system. And that's why I think it needs really careful oversight. We have $45 million. We have 3,500 students. That's a lot of money. And I think that we can invest in each one of those students with great care and thoughtfulness while not dropping the interests of the teachers at the same time. Um, I think it's our, really our, our point of pride. It's the feather in our cap the school system, and for good reason. We have great teachers here, and teachers really are the backbone of it. Okay, Amanda? I agree wholeheartedly, I really do. I think you said it very well. I think that the schools um, are central to the, the vitality of the town, and we, if you ask a lot of the new residents why they're moving here, they cite the schools almost, as, almost unanimously as the first reason why they look to Hopkinton why they've come to here and, and they have high expectations of our schools. And I think that it's a big responsibility for school committee to, to meet those expectations and to prepare all of our kids, whether they're going on to college or going on to a career or going on to um, military, whatever, cert, whatever they're doing after graduation, we need to prepare each of them for that. And our residents expect it. And um, I, th I think it drives our property values. It, it's central. Okay, I'm rearranging my order. Yeah, I'm going to go back to this question. Okay. Um, but again, we're still focused on money and what, what everything costs. And, and I want to go back to, um, I did attend the candidates night last week, and there was a, a comment made by Meg at that um, event where you said, more money is not the solution, and what we need is vision. I'd like to get you know, more input on that and uh, Amanda's view as well on why you think that's so, um, based on the growth in the town, the number of new students coming in, and, and especially when you say what we need is a vision. Um, does that imply that there isn't one? Would you like to change it? You just, you know, just some more feedback on, on the statement. Sure. Do you want me to go first? Start off with Amanda. Okay. Um, I think that we've we have had a vision. I, I, I commend Dr. McLeod and, and um, 
the school committee in the past for coming up with our strategic plan. I think we had a real focus on early childhood education. We've got the Marathon School coming on board. We have done a lot to inter introduce um, co-taught classrooms and um, early intervention. And I think there has been a vision. I think we've been delivering on that. Um, I'm eager to see us um, refresh it in the next couple of years. In terms of the budget, um, I personally felt that the budget that the school committee originally voted was a more appropriate budget for delivering the school services. Um, so I, I do think that money is a, is, is a, a reality and it is a big concern and it costs money to educate. Um, this year with the town budget overall, we were facing, um, I think 65% of the general fund increase was due to debt service and um, contractually obligated salary increases. So when you're facing that, plus the growth in town, it is not surprising that the taxes are going up. And I would have liked to have seen one of the earlier um, iterations of the school budget pass to deliver better services. When I use the word vision, I, I hope I didn't imply that there hadn't been a kind of vision beforehand, um, because I do think Dr. McLeod has done a very effective job, but things are changing so much. And with this new influx of students and increasing number of students with special needs, I think we have to rethink our curriculum, for example. Um, the kinds of changes that we need to make don't necessarily require more money. They require more thinking about what benefits individual students in the classroom. You know, I'm surprised that the majority of conversations I have about the school and school committee always revolve around money and dollars. And I fear, you know, we're losing sight of the students. We're thinking so much about how much is this costing us and we have a, we have a sense of pride in the fact that Hopkinton only spends $15,000 per student as opposed to Cambridge that spends $24,000. I'm not sure that you know, that's necessarily an important point. Um, are each of the students leaving school with a real sense of their self-worth and their ability? How do we measure that? So I'm really interested in having discussions about the quality of the education and its larger long-term impact, not necessarily measured by standardized tests or that kind of data. Okay, okay now for the next question. Um, can we have you both talk about the importance of class size and how does it relate to the budget process? And we will start off with Meg this time. I think I already mentioned a little something about class size, but you know, I, I teach at university and I have anywhere from maybe 15 to 30 students in a class at any given time. And it's clear to me that when I have a class of 15 or 16, they get a lot more from me and from the subject matter because of the rate of interaction and the participation that they're allowed in such a small classroom. When you have 30 kids, how much chance do they actually have to speak? You don't really start thinking, as I'm discovering right now, until you start speaking. And if they're 30 kids, how can they really get as much intellectually out of that space as they could? Um, I think co-teaching is a great model. Um, perhaps if we had more co-taught cl classes or classes with one general ed teacher and one special ed teacher, that would be a real boon to the students. Because we all need people who look us in the eye and pay attention to us. And I know that my son has had teachers in the past who have been so overwhelmed with the number of students that it's been hard for them, and I see that. Um, and I wonder if there's not some wiggle room in the budget elsewhere, but we don't have the space, the physical space, yet. Okay, Amanda? Yeah, I, I agree. I think class size is very important, and I think talking to, to parents, whether you have a child with a disability, an advanced learner, maybe an average learner who's getting lost in the shuffle. At the end of the day, if the teacher can take individual interest in the child, their growth and their development it is going to pay off in spades later on. And I think by having too large a class size, it's just impossible to have that connection between teacher and student for every student. Um, 
So it is definitely something that we need to keep an eye on. We don't, again, there is a trade-off with budget because we have to fund the headcount to keep the class size small, and we have to have space to have classrooms such as in Elmwood, and, and the middle school is getting tight. I mean, it, it's all interrelated to money, which is probably why the questions keep coming back to money. But in an ideal world, absolutely, I think um, finding creative ways to have more adults being able to connect with kids in the classroom um, is critical. All right, thank you very much. And for the next question, uh, can you talk about your stance on the turf field project and why? And this time we'll start off with Amanda. Okay. Um, well, I was a soccer player in a previous life, and um, I have to say as a soccer player, I love grass. I mean, there's no denying it. Grass is a great turf to play on. Um, as a parent of two soccer players who are, are at the high school, um, I am absolutely in favor of the turf field project. Um, my older son played four years on varsity and we traveled to every other district in the TVL and we are way behind in our facilities. The availability of facilities, um, the availability of time clocks and bleachers and I mean our facilities are just not in, in the same league as anyone else's. And for many of these kids, athletics are a road to college. I think it's going to help these kids get into college. Um, and we have a very sort of scattered um, facilities approach right now. We do some practicing at Fruit Street. We had the soccer team had the turf, the grass field um, vandalized last year. When we were at Turf Street, we did not have trainers on site. We had several games where there were twisted ankles. There was no medical trainer to tend to that. It's a safety concern. Um, and I just, I think that it is time in the town that we, the school committee and the athletic field subcommittee, I think they're called, have done tremendous work to find a way to fund this project in a way that will only impact our tax dollars in the ballpark of $25 per household for the average household. And um, they put it on the ballot last year and realized they weren't really ready. They hadn't done all the due diligence. They pulled it off before the vote. And they have done a tremendous amount of work looking at organic fill, infill, um, finding safe ways to deliver turf that will allow m maximum number of teams to use it and also to generate re revenue. So I support it. Okay, thank you. Meg? Um, I support it too. From what I know about it, um, the school committee has been working on this for a spell. Um, I think it's going to cost something like 3.5 million, am I right, or 3.2 million? But the Community Preservation Committee, I think, has raised funds, um, and that's quite a noble enterprise, and it's a model for the rest of us when we want to grow a part of the school to try to raise funds from outside it to support that endeavor. Um, you know, having tried to walk through those very fields myself two weeks ago, and been up to my ankles in mud, I realized the need for them throughout the school year um, for the students to be able to go outside on play, play on them in inclement weather. Um, I don't think it, it would hurt us in any way to have those and be able to rent those fields to other parties too to come on. Um, I was not a soccer player like Amanda, but I was a ferocious field hockey player. So as long as you allow that sport to be played on the field, I, I support the turf fields. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank you both uh, again for coming today. And it is now time for closing statements. Each of you will have two minutes for a closing statement. We will start off with Meg for the closing statement. Um, as you all know, I've never run for public office. I find it a most peculiar occupation. Um, but what I, I look forward to is actually working on a team. I teach on a team at BU, and I really like and admire the school committee members who are already in their positions. I think Amanda and I make a, a nice match because we have very different skill sets. Um, and so far, we haven't had any heated vitriolic battles with each other, but I hope they come just to kind of light up the skies a bit. Um, I love education, it's my life. I, I think about it all the time. I, I think about trying to make the, the school day better for every child. Um, and I like getting my hands dirty. I like working hard on those things. 
And so if you think you want someone like that, I'd be very happy to represent you. Thank you. Okay, Amanda. And I've wanted to run for school committee for some time. I think um, I really enjoyed working and volunteering at a lower level with kids. Um, and I've kind of waited. And it was really last year when my oldest son went off to college. It, it provides sort of a checkpoint. And I, I remember both of us, my son and myself, my husband, looked back sort of on his K-12 to experience. And you start to look at the different things that were important when your child you thought were critical when they were in third grade and you realized it wasn't a big deal. Or you didn't think it was a big deal in ninth grade, but actually kind of it was a big deal. And you know, looking back, I, I feel like I've, I have a much better perspective now on the whole journey and how the pieces fit together. And that's sort of why now is the time that I'm coming forward, even though it's kind of been on the, in my mind for a while. I think that I can bring that perspective and that experience um, and there are things that I would like to sort of bring to the forefront that um, kind of escape my notice along that journey that I, I want to help other parents um, take advantage of. And I'm excited about the direction of the town. I think the town is growing. It is um, changing its, its shape a little bit. And I am excited for the richness that uh, all the new citizens are bringing to our culture. And um, it's just a really great time, and I'm, I'm happy to run. I'm happy to work on the difficult pro uh, problems. I realized um, volunteering, my favorite things to do are to think sort of big picture and strategic, do strategic planning uh, and solve problems uh, in, within constraints. And I think the school committee has a number of problems, a lot of tight constraints. And I think as a committee, we can really work together and. Um, get creative and try to do the best we can to serve our kids. So I would love for you to vote for me if you'd like a hard worker who's eager for the job. All right, thank you very much. All right, well, I would like to once again thank our school committee candidates who participated today. That will do it for this portion of our Hopkinton town election contested races debate. And when we come back, we'll come back around 8 p.m. It'll be time for our planning board debate. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with more debate on HCAM. This week on Wake Up and Smell the Poetry. Poets, storytellers, and musicians perform and share their original works. Recycling the radiant of a wooden floor. The closed windows shuts out the air and noise from the street below. Sunlight seeps through glass and grill work, glowing like lacquer on their backs. Hello and welcome back to HCAM. For our next contested races debate, we have all three candidates for planning board, Ms. Deborah Feinberg, Mr. Mark Hyman, and Ms. Mary Larson Marlowe. There are two open seats for planning board. Before we start, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to participate this evening. Our format for these debates is simple. We will alternate asking each candidate questions, and they will have up to one minute to respond. If you hear the bell, you have 10 seconds remaining. If a candidate has a follow-up response to another candidate's comment, they can state they would like to make an additional comment. I will cue them, and the candidate will have 30 seconds for the comment. A panelist may ask a follow-up question, and the candidate will have up to one minute to respond. Following the question and answers, each candidate will have up to two minutes each for a closing statement. Questions for this debate will be asked by Jim Kleinkoff of the Hopkinton Independent and myself. So let's get started with our first question. And the first question is, can you describe what you feel the purpose is of the planning board? And we will start off with Deb for our first answer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for um, joining us. Um, my answer to that question is um, pretty directly into balancing between what the public views as, um, as as they're important to them or what the property owners want and what the community says it wants. Um, the plan planning board um, does not get to choose or pick. We, we um, can't 
choose the big box stores we want. Um, we can't, um, but we can be responsive. Um, we can be responsive to the owners that choose to do their business with our town. Um, and the the nice the nice thing is that um, I would like to participate and I would like to listen to what their needs are and how we can better serve them and bring their business into town. Um, but I'd also like to balance that with a, an excessive amount of growth that we've had um, so that it's more viable and a happy, uh, wonderful place to live that it has, has been for years. Um, it, it, dur during that, um, we're, we're balancing the citizens' concerns. Um, we're looking for the hours of um, operations of different buildings, public buildings, and um, we need to realize where we have input um, and um, how we can be their better advocates for both parties. Okay, Mark. Thank you, Tom. Um, to me, the purpose of the planning board is really um, broken into two areas. The first major area is a proactive one, um, where the planning board helps uh, set some policies for growth in the town. Um, that includes input on the master plan, um, revamping that, and uh, the zoning bylaws. Um, every year, overseeing the zoning advisory committee, proposing bylaw changes to town meeting, and um, you know, by those, helping to guide the direction growth moves in town. Um, the second main uh, main area for the planning board is really the reactive piece, and that's dealing with the applications that are made um, to you know to undergo development for particular properties in town. And for that, um, you know the the planning board um, has to evaluate under the existing rules, can't change the rules in the middle of the game. Um, but it gets a chance to um, when uh, you know when developers are proposing things that uh, they need a little relief on, it gets a chance to negotiate with them a touch to uh, to better improve the development for uh, the abutters and for the town as a whole. So I think those are the two main functions for the planning board. Okay, Mary. Hello, and thank you, Cage Cam, for sponsoring this event. Um, the planning board is um, is responsible for uh, within the the rules and laws of the state and the zoning bylaws of the town to um, negotiate with developers and uh, comment on both concept plans and more detailed development plans that are brought before them in addition um, the planning board is responsible for looking to the future and as mark said um, working within the master plan, which is in place um, uh, fairly recently, as of 2017, the, um, the implementation plan within the master plan has very good um, guidelines and uh, time-based time uh, measurements in terms of implementation for certain activities. Um, and, um, and also, you know, uh, making changes to zoning bylaws, some of the, some of the um, uh, functions within the master plan implementation are to review and do more research on certain zoning um, bylaw changes that we might want to implement. And so th those are some of the things that are very important for the planning board. All right, thank you. Uh, Jim, you have our next question. Mark will answer first. Let's talk about growth. Um, do you think the town's growing too fast, not fast enough? Uh, what type of growth, if any, do you support and why? In other words, do you embrace the growth or do you want to pull up the drawbridge? <laughs> um, well, thanks, Jim. Um, you know, I don't want to pull up the drawbridge, but I think we have to, we have to look at growth um, and try and manage it more effectively. Um, we've had a lot of rapid growth in town um, over the past several years, particularly with some of the big developments, Legacy, The Muse, and what have you, and that has had impact on services in the town. Um, whether you look at the schools, fire, and, uh, and other safety issues, uh, DPW even. So I, I think I, I support growth in town, and really we can't stop growth. We can't keep developers from, um, from developing um, within the rules. Um, but what we can do um, is help to manage it better um, and also help, to plan, help the town plan for it. Um, I think one of the things that was called for in the master plan that I'm not sure has, has been followed through as well as it could be is um, to require developers to, um, you know, to comment in their applications on the impact of the development for services in the town, and then for the planning board to report on that to the town so that the town can take action on that. I'm not really sure that that's, uh, that's been done as effectively as it might be. 
Um, and you know, the, the master plan has a number of other good recommendations that I think we can look to. But um, effectively, I think you know, we need to look to manage the growth we have, uh, not to just stop it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Um, growth is, is difficult for all of us to manage because um, most people co move into a town and don't want things to change. But that's not realistic. Um, there's a, a certain limits that we have to operate under. Um, just legally, um, unless the town is willing to buy up all undeveloped land, um, <laughs> there is going to be growth. Um, certainly by having great schools and a really wonderful community to live in, that um, attracts more growth to the town. Um, so uh, the best that, that we can do within town government is to set up guidelines ahead of time so that we do not end up seeing structures built or developments built that we say, gee, if we had thought perhaps to ask them to do it this way, it would have been better. And that's much too late in the process. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to see the planning board spending a lot of time to negotiate and discuss with developers um, the proper ways to do things that um, we get input from a lot of town um, residents and businesses and make the growth uh, palatable to everyone. Okay, Deborah? I'll piggyback on um, Mary's um, and I'd like to um, look at the master plan and I'd like to to re-examine it as not a finished product 19, you know, circa 19, um, uh, 2017 and I and I'd like to look at the green spaces and see where we have to go and continue to throw trace paper over it and see what's available and how we can work with government work with uh, landowners to create the kind of trail system we want the type type of bikes paths we want um, and connections between schools um, I think that's something that I, I haven't seen as much and um, I'd like to improve upon um, going forward, there are there are um, specific there is specific language in the uh, master plan that suggests that we revisit some of this, and um, I'd like to be part of that to do, to um, revisit those those proposals. Okay. Our next question is: Are you familiar with, and where do you stand on the zoning advisory committee proposed changes to the bylaws, which will be voted on? at town meeting. For this one, we'll start off with Mary. Well, all three of us have been members of the Zoning Advisory Committee this last year. So all of us are familiar with these zoning bylaws. I can't list them, every single one of them, because I, I forgot to bring a list, but, I'm, uh, but I am familiar with them. Um, and I was at least a part of discussing each and every one of them. Are there specific um, questions that you might have or is that part of a follow-up? Is there uh, perhaps any of them that you have a strong opinion on? I think it was important to clarify the accessory dwellings um, zoning bylaw and I think that was an important one that we worked on. We discussed it for more than one meeting um, and, um, and there's a lot of different aspects to consider in terms of the size of an accessory dwelling, whether or not it needs to be limited to family members only, over 60 only, that sort of thing. Um, and there's the, the point of view of perhaps neighbors and point of view for resale of a particular house that has an accessory dwelling attached to it. But there's also the point of view of um, the people living there and wanting to provide a um, low cost but um, independent solution for aging parents or possibly for a um, partially grown child. <laughs> um, and, and so we did discuss that at length and I think we came to a, a fairly good compromise solution to clarify the bylaws on that one. Okay. And uh, Deborah, can you uh, talk about um, where you stand on any of the proposed changes to the bylaws that will be voted on at town meeting from the Zoning Advisory Committee? 
Um, I guess I can touch upon the um, the accessory buildings as well. Um, I thought it was because we haven't had that kind of regulation in town um, previously. It was a really great education going through this process because I have designed several um, accessory apartments in other towns. So it was really interesting to see what Hopkinson's approach was. And I think it's wonderful. Um, there's a, a true consideration for connected structures, um, for um, how people are going to access and how they're going to feel. I think we had a particularly sensitive um, conversation about how how it feels to be um, an aging um, baby boomer at, at coming to their to live with their family um, and or uh, a young um, adult also um, would be in that category um, and I think this is going to become more important in the future um, as this, as the town grows and is more densely populated, there are going to be other questions that will pop up, and I think um, the um, ZA, the the Zach, Zach will take a look at those types of um, problems and address them as they rise. Okay. Quick follow interjection, Mark. Could you speak to one of the other six other than accessory? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I'd like to speak to accessory because that was one I sponsored a bit, but, um, but let me speak to one of the others uh, I did. Um, there's a conversions bylaw that uh, is rather similar to the accessory. Um, as the bylaw stands now, uh, you know, a single family home can be converted up to four units um, for, as the bylaw reads, for rental purposes. And at ZBA, we had our first application that I had seen for one of those in the last year. And um, it, you know it made sense in that in that time, but we looked into it and uh, were advised that uh, we really can't enforce the rental purposes aspect of it. And it essentially allows someone to take a single family and turn it into an apartment building without going through any of the types of permitting that would otherwise be required for that sort of dense use. So we talked about it at, at Zach and thought that it would be best, at least at this point, to limit that uh, conversion from four units to two. Um, and that would bring it more towards uh, something along the accessory, uh, accessory dwelling uh, line. Um, and I think it's worth looking at that bylaw again in the future um, and whether it's needed at all. But I think as a first pass to, to, um, you know, to help us um, avoid some uh, you know, overly dense growth in, uh, in otherwise fairly spaced out neighborhoods, um, we thought we should do something there. All right. Uh, Jim, you have the next question. I do. Um, can you define and hopefully expand on that definition of the acronym OSMUD, O-S-M-U-D? Deborah can answer first. Um. Osmud or open space land preservation? What was what was, was the what, uh, what, what was uh, the acronym? O S M U D. Do you know what it stands for? No, I don't. Okay. I don't. Does that anyone else? I'm guessing open space mixed use development. Bingo. So, I just haven't heard it in the acronym form. Oh, okay. So, go ahead, Deb. Open space mixed use. Um, in its place, I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, to piggyback affordable housing in a situation like that. I think that in the past it's been poo-pooed in the town um, and has turned some developments away. Um, I think there's, um, it depends, you know, it depends on where the placement would be. But other than that, I don't know much about it. Okay. All right, Mark. Uh, so the the Osmud was the district that was created um, essentially for legacy farms. Uh, it was the open space mixed use development um, that was created, uh, really tailored only for legacy farms. Uh, and I suspect we'll be we looking to amend the bylaws once legacy is done. Um, you know, I think it, it was um, it was a good idea. To, um, to try and take a large chunk of land and figure out how to preserve a, a fair amount of open space while at the same time allowing for the development that we knew a developer would, uh, would be planning to do. 
and at the outset also try and mitigate some of the impact to the town, um, you know, through a host community agreement where there were payments made to the town um, and otherwise. I know it's been modified um, um, since it was originally planned. For example, the, the commercial development on the north side has been changed over to the senior, which was just approved. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it probably isn't uh, the same thing that was expected when it was originally put into place once now that it's on the ground. But I think um, Legacy as a whole has brought, uh, you know, not only a lot of growth, but a lot of vibrancy to the town. Um, I think revenue wise, it's probably um, significantly positive to the town. Um, although managing the services that all that extra growth is requiring is, uh, is a bit of a chore. And I think we have to do more in that regard. Mary? So open space, mixed use development, just in general, um, again, is to, uh, to put in place residential, office, retail, all together, but preserving open space um, in that particular development. So that's, that's the concept behind it. And, and as Mark was saying, you know, in Hopkinton, it refers to legacy farms. Obviously, we've only seen residential thus far, and I don't believe there's any plans to do to office space at this point. Um, but although I wasn't around when the decision was being made for um, this uh, this particular thing, uh, I believe the the idea was that we have nodes of retail in several different spots within um, Hopkinton. One is near 495 um, uh, intersection, and then um, then there's the middle of town, and then Legacy Farms w would be if it does develop the retail aspect of it, provide another node there, so that not everybody has to travel all the way across town or to other towns to do small retail purchases. So from that concept, it, it is a good concept. And um, and as as my counterparts said, you know, there's still growth to be to be seen in legacy farms, and to see whether or not it truly becomes a mixed use development. Okay, thank you. I'd like to um, jump in on that too. Um, I think that we haven't really seen legacy develop into a multi-use development at all. Um, I think it's pretty much the same way it was. It's mixed use. It, it, well, we haven't seen it um, develop that way significantly that would um, define itself as that. It's the same old retail store that was there, um, and it's it's um, apartments that are around. Um, like, I don't see offices. I don't see much shopping going on yet. Um, but I know that there's a future and there's, there is the land to do that. Um, where I have seen the challenge is downtown by Lumber Street. I've seen a lot of growth of traffic and I've seen some considerations that I think could um, improve with some more observation. Um, one of the things that we did work on um, was um, that I really enjoyed was going through the town and seeing the dark skies um, community um, look, um, community plan, um, look at what it is to me, what it means to be a dark sky community. Um, and we started to look at the lighting levels and how the lighting is affected in those communities in our community, in that area. Yeah, I just want to say that um, the Osmud, which is, is a mix of open space and residential, has become the preferred um, by the planning board uh, plan for developers to submit. All developers are asked first to submit an Osmud plan. Um, and, you know, and then they base their, the number of houses on a conventional plan, but um, they're asked to submit an Osmud first. The uh, Chamberlain Whalen was denied an Osmud because of the um, cul-de-sacs and came back with a different plan. But Osmud is, pretty, is used a lot. And the green space. Okay. I think we're ready for the next question. All right, uh, have you attended or watched any planning board meetings? And can you explain the extent you have studied the town's zoning bylaws? We'll start off with Mark for this one. Uh, well, the second is, is straightforward. Um, I've served on the Zoning Board of Appeals now for 
uh, for four years, including three as chair. So um, I've, I've studied the zoning bylaws quite a bit, um, and, I'm, and I'm pretty familiar with them. Um, with respect to planning board, I've attended a few meetings, um, and I've watched a few on the replays. Um, in terms of um, what specific questions you had with regard to planning board? Uh, have you attended or watched any of the meetings, and can you explain the extent you have studied the town's zoning bylaws? Okay, well, I, I think I've touched them both, but I'll say with respect to the, the planning board meetings, um, you know, in part one of the reasons I decided to run um, fairly late in the game for, uh, for planning board is because, um, you know, I think there's, um, you know, there's been some problems at the planning board at meetings lately. Um, and I think, um, you know, with new members, what would be helpful for the planning board is some additional experience, um, you know, in the issues the planning board deals with, as well as um, some help in negotiating um, complex issues where people are heated and uh, doing it in a way that's collegial. Um, I'm not sure that's been as evident um, in recent times as it should be. Mary? Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm on the Zoning Advisory Committee this year, and so I have read through the bylaws. I don't have them memorized. <laughs> and I have been attending many planning board meetings and uh, watching, um, w or watching them on HCAMP when I can. Um, so the... Um, the, the, that's a really great um, option, is to be able to watch it at home. <laughs> so, thank you. Mm, absolutely. Deborah. Hi. Um, I actually have watched it in, um, um, both on HCAM and um, in person. And I, have, I feel strongly that I have some really good input um, in the overall organization of the meetings. Um, I've come up with um, sort of a laminated sheet that I think the the peop that the applicants could provide information about terminology for the homeowners, so that when the terminology comes up, they understand what they're what they're talking about on the plan. Um, you know, what is a swale? What is an enclosed um, sewer system? Um, what are with, um, there was another situation where what is the maximum width of a, of a drive? Um, and, and, and what does a, what turning radius does a truck need? I mean, so there's some real, really fun, basic um, concepts that we can put together on a sheet and have them at the door that people could bring in as a cheat sheet to look at. Um, that was one idea. And another idea is to let perhaps um, the petitioners, um, the the, the 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 town the town people who are affected by whatever development comes in have them almost stand up and ask their questions first then we'll know a little bit um, like because people are very aware and this would give people um, a, a, the planning board a chance to understand where they're coming from and could potentially divert some of the time that's spent at the meeting um, answering questions Follow up on that. Um, Mark used the front word problems. Um, there have been problems. I've been covering the board now on a regular basis for three years. Past year has been filled with a lot of problems. I talked about it with Elaine Lazarus, planning uh, in the, the planning office. She writes it off to the learning curve with the new members, um, and it may be part of that. Um, I've also witnessed. Um, some power struggles, some politics, um, which leads me to the next question. Um, Deb, you and I talked when I was doing my story on the um, candidates uh, who were applying for a planning board. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the fact that you had um, applied for um, an open seat vacated by Kelly and that you were also running for another seat in the election. And I asked you why, and you said, um, Darlene Hayes told me to do that because it would uh, cover more of our bases. Um, I mean, I'm not naive enough to think that politics don't, don't play in elections in Hopkinton, but don't you think we ought to keep them out of the actual board meetings? Oh, most definitely. Um, what I enjoy actually about running 
um, as I've learned from each one of my opponents. And I continue to learn and grow from everybody that I communicate with and yourself. Um, I think that there is a little bit of politic, political play um, in elections, but I also wanted to, to have this opportunity, um, and so I jumped at it, and I jumped at both opportunities because it was explained to me that it was a possibility. Okay, would anyone else like to jump in on that, or are we ready for the next one? Okay. I, I'd like to think that in town, at the town level, um, politics aren't as important as at the national level. And, um, and I certainly think that's the case with the three of us candidates. Um, the, any of the two of us um, out, of, out of our three would be great on the planning board, I really believe. And I think we'd all work very well together and with the other um, planning board members. Um, and I think that it's, it's admirable how much time and effort all of the volunteers put into the planning board and to the other boards that they're on. Thank you. One more quick follow-up, um, and I, I apologize. Deb, um, Brian at, at one point mentioned civil discourse, I think, on candidates tonight. You were, um, you mentioned historical district in your, in your background. You were on the historic district commission in the early 2000s, and um, the selectment at that point in 2003 decided not to reappoint you. Do you want to talk about the reasons behind that? I never really found out. It was, um, I think that it was a very strange political move. And um, I was happily, I happily wanted to, to, to go back to my private life. I, but I think after this last put, I think with the wonderful things that are happening in town, I um, decided that I would like to um, go back and come back and, and talk about and try to work with everyone to, to look at what's going on and to look at the growth and to try to make it the best we can make Hopkinton. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, for our next question, uh, well, Jim, you can ask the uh, next okay. question. Okay. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, there have been times this year, specifically um, one bad meeting, where two hearings, two public hearings on developments had to be postponed because of an absence in members, um, primarily that um, there weren't enough members at that meeting um, who had, the way it works is you, you can only miss one hearing, um, and then you can watch it on tape. If you miss more than that, you're ineligible to vote on that particular issue. We had so many missing that um, they had to postpone both hearings. I, I'll quickly go over uh, absences. Irfan had five. Chairman John Ferrari uh, missed two. Uh, Kelly Carp missed six. Cliff Kistner missed seven. Um, so there was more than a learning curve, obviously. Um, the question is, I know you all have backgrounds, you work, um, you've all got pretty big jobs, families. Um, are you going to be able to make the meetings? We'll start off with Deborah. Yeah. Hot seat. Um, well, I certainly believe that if I obligate myself to do something, I will follow through. Um, I would like to um, really study the minutes, and that's something I haven't done yet. Um, that are handed out on Thursday nights to see where we can maybe simplify things. So my big call, call to order is to try to work with everybody to try to get the, min, get the meetings down to a, size, uh, a, a nice contained um, platform. Um, but I, but I can't, haven't had the opportunity to really look at those minutes to see where they can become manageable. Um, so, so my hope is to help us to, to manage some of that sprawl, so to speak. Okay, Mark. So I, I wouldn't have run, uh, agreed to run for planning board if I didn't uh, intend to make the meetings. Um, I think one of the issues for me will be, um, I, at the moment I'm still serving on uh, ZBA. Um, I'm up for reappointment this year, and um, 
you know, while I don't think I could do both forever, um, that's a, a huge time commitment. Um, I've committed to uh, a couple of the folks on the ZBA to, uh, if the selectmen uh, from the new board would uh, reappoint me, to at least overlap for a while to make sure that um, we have a succession plan in place and that that board, which has been running well, um, can, uh, can continue on in the same fashion. But no, I, I, I wouldn't have applied if I didn't intend to meet it. And at least they're recorded, so we don't have that option at the planning or at the ZBA. Okay, Mary? And I, I can reiterate what, what Mark and Deb have said. I um, would not have run if I wouldn't intend to attend all the meetings. And I didn't miss any of the uh, ZAC meetings, so. Okay, thank you very much. It is now time for closing statements. Each you will have up to two minutes to make a closing statement, and we will start off with Mary. Thank you again for this opportunity. I think it's very important for the voters to be able to learn who the candidates are. Although, as I'll say again, I think um, all three of us would be good choices. So, um, But I wanted to say that um, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to serve the town, to give back. Um, I've been here for 15 years and um, raising my children and working full time. But um, now that they're a little bit older, I'm feeling um, like I have the, the available time to really devote to other activities. And um, this, is, uh, this is something that seems exciting to me and seems very interesting. And I believe I would um, give a good, um, fresh perspective because um, I'm all about coming in with no agenda and listening to lots of different points of view before I draw conclusions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? Thanks. Um, Jim, Tom, I'd like to thank you and thank HCAM for running this forum. This has been great. Um, and I'd like to thank my fellow candidates for um, you know, really for running a collegial campaign. And I think this is the sort of thing we, need, we all need to bring to planning board. Um, you know, I decided to run, as I said, because I, I think um, you know, I, I brought my experience um, to the town for the ZBA uh, when there was an opening. and um, you know, planning board, I think, um, you know, needs, uh, needs uh, you know, uh, more folks who have a little bit of grounding in the zoning bylaws, who understand the issues that are coming, coming forward, and um, who are willing to, to work um, and keep some of the partisanship out of, um, you know, out of the discussions and, uh, and the debates. Um, you know, I think I can bring some of that um, from the ZBA over to planning board if I'm elected. Um, you know, I moved to town five years ago with my family because of the great character of Hopkinson. Um, I'd like to see that continue. I'd like to see it continue through the growth we've had and through the growth I'm sure we're going to continue to have. Um, you know, I think residential growth uh, we've had a lot of recently, and it's probably going to slow down a bit because there's not as many huge uh, tracks to develop. Um, but what we really need to start working on is both encouraging more, um, more business development in town, more business growth, particularly over on South Street. Um, I had said the other night I was really encouraged to see that uh, Lake Pharma is bringing 100 jobs over there to, uh, by opening up a biologics facility. I think that's a, that's a wonderful addition to town. Um, and we should look to find more ways of doing that. One thing we did um, on Zach and the planning board endorsed was uh, opening up the hotel overlay to try and bring in a hotel, uh, which so far the town hasn't been successful with, but that would be a great addition as well. Um, so I guess in closing, I'd, I'd like to ask for your vote. This is my first time running for, uh, for a public office, uh, like, like some of the other candidates. Um, so it's been an uh, interesting experience, um, but I'd like to, uh, you know, to bring um, you know, my experience from the uh, ZBA over to planning board and uh, help benefit the town there. Thanks. All right, thank you. Deborah. Um, the, the new developments have brought in, and, and my new, the new term is, um, what is the new term? S smock? Um, have, have brought in new developments and new viability for Hopkinton. Um, I would like the ability to work objectively, I would like the, the, the honor of working objectively to produce re, um, results driven by complex decisions. Um, I would, I would also like the ability to look at these zoning bylaws and to look at where we can plan, plan for more growth and where we can get that positive economic um, 
um, tax incentive um, to business, whether they're big pharma, whether they're um, a museum. Um, if, if placed correctly, I think it could be a wonderful thing. Um, there's just so so many wonderful little um, I, things happening in Hopkinton, and um, and I think they can come together. And I'd like to look at the master plan and recreate it or revision it in in, in where it's possible. Um, so I, I just would ask for your vote. Um, I would enjoy the opportunity, um, and I would be dedicated for um, to the to, to the planning board and its meetings. Thank you. Well, thank you all again for participating today. Well, that is going to wrap up our planning board candidates debate. Once again, a big thank you to the candidates who participated today. That will do it for this portion of our Hopkinton Town election contested races candidates debate. We're going to take a couple of minutes of a break. And when we come back, we will hear from our final group of candidates this evening, the Board of Selectmen. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more debate on HCAMP. Have you ever considered texting and driving? If so, you should know the consequences. If caught texting and driving for the first time, you could get an $100 fine plus your license taken away for 60 days. The consequences only get worse the more you get caught. Even if you don't get caught, there could be serious effects. You could get into a car accident and hurt yourself or someone else. Texting and driving is a very dangerous combination, so stop before this happens to you. Welcome back to HCAM. For our next contested races debate, we have all three candidates for the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Brian Herr, Mr. Patrick Atwell, and Mr. Irfan Nasrullah. Our format for this debate is simple. We will alternate asking each candidate questions, and they will have up to one minute to respond. If you hear the bell, you have 10 seconds remaining. If a candidate has a follow-up response to another candidate's comment, they can state they would like to make an additional comment. I will cue them, and the candidate will have 30 seconds for the comment. A panelist may ask a follow-up question, and the candidate will have up to one minute to respond. Following the question and answers, each candidate will have up to two minutes each for a closing statement. Questions for this debate will be asked by Michelle Murdoch from the Hopkinton Independent and myself. And for the first question, we'll turn things over to Michelle. Welcome. Okay, so um, as you might expect, the first question is going to be related to the budget since that was a challenging process this year. And, and my question um, is really kind of a result of a question that was asked at the candidates, the women's candidates night the other night when you were asked, how would you balance the budget? And I thought about that, and what I'd really like to know is, are you familiar with the selectman's role as defined in the town charter with respect to the budget? And if so, what is it? And for this question, we'll start off with Irfa. So the, um, so the specific question is, the Board of Selectmen's role with regard to the budget? Correct. So I think um, principally what we're doing at the Board of Selectmen are doing is seeking the input and coordinating all the various town uh, boards and departments, seeking their input in the budgetary process, coordinating those uh, the various boards and um, making recommendations, trying to incorporate and uh, facilitate a discussion so that they can come to agreement on uh, on what their what their requirements are and what they can what they can provide. Okay. Patrick. So look at what I said. I think it's do I have to press the button? Can you hear me? So I think it's uh, as a selectman, you know, like you know, we're at the top, I guess they say, but we work with all the different departments and they uh, they come to us with their agendas and with their with their budget plans and I think as a group as a whole, the uh, selectmen work together with the departments to figure out, to make sure it's going to fit in the budget, where recommendations, where they should make cuts, where they shouldn't. But I think it's the role is to work together with all departments to figure out the budget. Right. 
So the charter outlines the specific steps that the selectmen should follow as they set the budget forward each calendar year, each fiscal year. It starts with a budget message. Well, actually, it starts with the selectmen getting together with other key entities in town and setting the timeline for the budget. And then once we set the timeline for the budget, we begin to walk, we, we begin to walk through a process, and that process is outlined in the charter. And I think it's a seven or eight step process. It begins with the budget message, and then we go from budget message to reaching out to the various uh, uh, town department heads and those folks submit their initial budgets to the town manager and we go through a process there and we work our way down a list getting for school committee input obviously a big budget uh, in town and then eventually gets to appropriations committee appropriations committee does their thing with public hearings uh, and then it comes back to the selectmen again and we submit to town meeting so there's a whole process process that the selectmen oversee and uh, it, it can be a, a pretty arduous process at times it was a difficult process for us this year uh, we got through it we've got a good budget going to town meeting uh, next week. It is balanced, and uh, I look forward to uh, town meeting voting on it. Okay, Michelle. Okay, the, the next question is also uh, related to the budget, and it kind of follows on part of Brian's answer um, to the process. Um, in the beginning of the process, the selectmen typically do set a budget message. Um, and when doing so, the discussion often starts, or it has in the past, with, with a choice between level funding, which is keeping the budgets flat with no increases, or level services, you know, allowing budget increases to maintain levels of service. So the question is, overall, if you had to describe your municipal funding preferences, are you a proponent of a level funded or a level service budget and why? And Patrick, you can answer first. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so I'd say be a proponent of um, the services. So I don't think we should just handcuff ourselves to staying flat. Uh, times change, things change, services change. And I think it's very important that we keep up with that. So if the budget has to go higher, you know, you got to go a little higher. But I think that's, that's the way to go. Okay. And, uh, next is Brian. So uh, level funding typically is very difficult to achieve because we've got contractual obligations uh, across town government. Um, that would make that almost impossible. You know, there's two or three percent increases, all, all kinds of different things in the contractual obligation side that we'd have to consider. Level services uh, is, is, is an excellent goal, but it's not sort of how I approach it. I look for demonstrated need and services required by the community. And that can change every year, to Patrick's point. Um, so we always talk about demonstrated need and when town departments come to us and they present their ideas and their interests and their desires for their budget for the next fiscal year, I ask a lot about what are your demonstrated needs. Show me why you need the money and then we can decide if it makes sense or not based on what the community would feel about those needs. So level services, I would air to your question directly, level services, I'd go with that answer. Uh, but I do think it's more than that and it's, a, it's an annual thing that needs to be studied carefully. Well, I would also go with the level services. I think that's, um, you know, as, as, a, as a resident in town, what we're looking for is service from our town. Um, I think having at least the, the same level of service uh, from year to year is something that we would strive for. That said, I think Brian's point is very well taken in that, you know, each department is going to have its own needs. And as the town grows, each department would have different needs. Uh, they may be more so, they may be less so. So you kind of, I think it, it makes a lot of sense to approach each department with, uh, with a needs analysis with the goal of maintaining service. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right, the next question is, how would you rate your understanding of municipal finance and how important is this uh, for a selectman to know? Brian, you could start. How would I rate my understanding of municipal finance? I would give myself, on a scale of an A through an F, typical grade process, uh, I'd give myself an A minus. Uh, I don't uh, fully understand all the intricacies of some of the things associated with, with, with the enterprise funds and how the enterprise funds work inside the overall budget uh, process. Uh, but I think, in general, I have a very solid understanding of how municipal finance works. Uh, it can be very challenging. It's very complex. And uh, I think experience, I mean, that's kind of what this, uh, a lot of the discussion about the role of selectmen is you know, in, in, this, in this election year anyway. I think the experience that I bring to the table can be very beneficial to the board for the next couple of years. Okay. I think um, 
I think experience is really, really comes to uh, to the forefront when you're asking about what is, you know, what is our our grade for municipal finance. You know, what so Brian comes here with with a number of years working with uh, with the town and the board of selectmen. Um, I bring a different experience, um, one from state government working with um, with the Department of Environmental Protection, and in that role, we were also taking enforcement against a lot of towns. And in that role, I also had to find out exactly how the municipal finance worked. So for a grade, um, that was one <laughs> a career ago, but I would say uh, uh, as a grade, I would give myself a B plus. Um, I'm familiar with it. I know how it works. I know there's multiple facets to it. Um, having not served on the board of selectmen, I wouldn't be able to give myself the A plus that I would uh, think I would have by the end. Okay, Patrick. Uh, so since we're giving grades, uh, my grade, you know, honestly, municipal finance is, is not my experience. So my grade would probably be a C plus at best, if that. Um, you know, I've come from a union background, so the finance is like that with a, on a different level, different scale. But knowing that, knowing my education, you know, I'm a quick learner, and it's something obviously the selectmen need to know and need to brush up on real fast. So it's something I would work on real quick. Yeah. Okay. And now for our next question, uh, can you talk about what role do you feel selectmen play in managing town growth? Irfan, we'll start with you. Well, I, mean, I think the Board of Selectmen really serves as the town's chief executive office, right? So anything that's going to be coming forward is something that the, that the board has a leadership role in. But as far as managing growth, um, we have the the, t the town has various other boards and committees that are going to be looking at growth and looking at projects as they come in. The board of selectmen are going to be able to work with those various boards, but those other, say, the planning board, that has the primary responsibility of looking at compliance with any particular project. The board of selectmen has to let that board do its, you know, perform its function. Um, but in the same sense, as a, as the chief uh, executive. Uh, office in town, coordinating the various uh, boards becomes essential. Okay. Patrick? Uh, to Erfan's point, I think, you know, working with the planning board, you know, those are the ones that develop the town, the growth of it, you know, it is important that the selectmen have a role in that, but that's, you know, working side by side with them. You know, there are going to be times when there's going to be tough decisions made by the board of selectmen, which they do now, you know, they'll have to be made, but I think the role is to make sure we don't overstep our bound crossing those lines with the other boards and, you know, just listening and working with them. Okay. Brian? I first got involved in town government in 2002, I believe, uh, when I was appointed to the personnel committee. And then I was on the planning board for three years. I got elect appointed and then elected to the planning board. So I did five years of other stuff before I got involved as a selectman. And at that time and through my years as a selectman, I've seen growth in town uh, vary. So in, in the early 2000s, growth was very steady. It was very strong. It wasn't crazy. And then we hit the recession in 2008, 2009, and it came to a screeching halt, and there was zero growth. And then in 2013, maybe 2012, 2013, when money started to free up again and the developers woke up from their deep sleep, uh, all of a sudden it took off, and it's been exponential here the last few years, and frankly a little bit out of control in my view. Uh, so I've seen growth happen in different levels at different rates. I would like to go back to a much uh, slower, steadier rate of growth the Board of Selectmen definitely has a role in that, while not a direct role in approving uh, uh, plans and, and, and development applications, as Irfan uh, pointed out. Uh, but we do have a role when it comes to host community agreements that we would establish and negotiate with developers. And we have a role in seeking out certain types of businesses coming to town through our economic development engine. Those kinds of things uh, would play into any kind of growth that would take place. I would love to see the town take a two or three year hiatus and just chill for a couple of years and let all of us adjust to the new school, the new library, the new DPW, the expenses associated with that, the tax burden associated with that, and maybe in a couple more years, kind of start that growth again. That's my personal wish. Okay, thank you. Michelle, I believe you have a follow-up. I, I do have one follow-up. So um, it's, it's related to the growth question, and I guess what I wanted to ask was, what are your feelings on the current state of the residential commercial split in Hopkinton? Do you think it should stay the same? Which way should it shift? 
Um, where should it go from here? And we'll start off with Patrick. So I think the registered the uh, residential growth has say peaked. It's uh, slowing down a bit, and I think that it's important that we keep businesses coming in. Um, let's pick and choose what business we want in this community, but. I think I'd, I'd rather see some more uh, business revenue coming in into the town. Residence has reached its peak. Let's leave that where it's at. But we got to continue growing in the other sense with business. So I, I would have business catch up with the residential growth. Yeah. Okay. Brian? So I'm dating myself going back to 2002, 2003. I think the split at that time was 84, 16, 84 residential and 16 commercial. And here we are. 15 years later and it's 85 15 or thereabouts so we've talked about it a lot as a community and everybody that runs for office says let's get more commercial growth let's get more, more commercial growth I was one of those people I said it in 2007 I said it in 2010 and I'm not saying it in 2018 because it doesn't happen okay the fact of the matter is we are a residential prim primarily a residential community we're a suburb of Boston now we've got to maintain our character as best we can of a quiet country town but the reality is it's going to be very hard for us to bring in a ton of commercial development. South Street can handle some more, and maybe we can do a couple of other retail up spots. But really, the, the, the ratio has been there for 15 years. It was probably there for 15 years before I came to town. Uh, and I think we just have to accept that and do the best we can managing around that. Okay. Irfan? Well, I uh, respect both opinions. I think, um, I think that commercial growth is something that we need in, the, in town. Um, I agree that the... the Hopkinton is a, is a residential community, you know, with a small town character, and that's something that we all want to maintain. But the fact of the matter is, if uh, we're going through a difficult budgetary process currently, and um, part of that is the, the revenues aren't there from the commercial side. Um, I'd like to see that, I'd like to see the commercial growth, uh, commercial industry grow in town to uh, take a little bit of the burden on the, the tax burden off of uh, the residential character. Um, and, and with that, I mean, you know, in the past 10 years, we've also seen commercial growth all around us in all the surrounding towns, um, in Westboro, in Milford, uh, well, not so much in Upton, but, you know, we've seen the other towns grow their, their commercial base. So I think that it's something that we can do, and I think it's something that we're trying to do. It's just a matter of uh, kind of completing the, the execution on that. Uh, I think so far we've done a decent job, but we could do better. Okay. And we will move on to our next question. Uh, how do you ensure that the town manager and selectmen uh, have goals that are aligned? And we'll start off with Brian. How do we ensure that the town manager and the selectmen have goals that are aligned? Well, that's easy. This, the town manager works for the selectmen. Uh, I should say uh, tongue-in-cheek a little bit. No, so the town manager uh, role is defined in the charter. Uh, it's very clear that it says right in the charter that the town manager has a, vote, uh, has a voice, but not a vote at the Board of Selectmen meetings. In other words, the town manager, and I've always tried to treat the town managers uh, with that same level of respect, have that uh, equal uh, say, if you will, during the meetings, uh, but then the when it comes time to take a vote, uh, they, don't, they don't vote. Uh, it's easy to align with the town manager our goals and objectives if we all have open and consistent dialogue back and forth. The town manager has an awful lot of responsibility and the charter gives him an awful lot of responsibility to run our government day to day, uh, but he doesn't get to do it in a vacuum and he clearly has to be aligned with the board of selectmen or there would be a problem. Okay, Irfan? I mean, he said it tongue in cheek, but he's right. I mean, the town manager works for the board of selectmen. Um, so I think that the Board of Selectmen are going, to, are going to drive the agenda, and it is up to the town manager to accomplish that. So, and, and I think the Board of Selectmen have, have a voice in kind of correcting and changing course when they see that the town manager isn't kind of following course. Um, again, he doesn't have, a, he doesn't have a, a vote, but he certainly has a lot of experience and um, kind of fills the gap for, for, the, for the board in, um, in kind of executing that, that direction. Okay. Patrick, any thoughts? Uh, I guess it's just working together. You know, town manager, like both said, yeah, they work for the Board of Selectmen, but there has to be some, you know, negotiations with the town manager. We do have our agenda, and we'd like the town manager to follow it, but, you know, you got to take into experience as well, listen to what he has to say, and, you know, maybe his experience education compared with the other selectmen, you know, you compare that, get some notes. 
and uh, come up with a good idea and work together. Okay. And Michelle, I believe you have add something to that. Sure. Patrick, really good point here. Um, we have an excellent town manager. He does a fabulous job for the town of Hopkinton. He's very bright. He's very experienced, and he can. Uh, he's very driven. He's not a wallflower, and if he sees an opportunity to try and do something, he'll run off and try and do that. An experienced selectman is going to recognize when he's about to run off and maybe sometimes say, excuse me, we need to come back over here because we're not necessarily a community, is not necessarily interested in that over there. Um, he, he does a really good job because he's always trying to bring new opportunities for the community, but I think every now and then an experienced selectman is going to recognize when he's going off in a direction that he probably shouldn't go and bring him back in. Without knowing how the town manager operates, he could run off a little bit further than he necessarily should sometimes. And Michelle, I believe you had a follow-up. I had a follow-up because... Um, I mean, the, the obvious answer was, yes, that the, uh, the town manager reports to the Board of Selectmen, but there's an entire town range of departments that s report to the town manager. So he does have autonomy in that sense, and according to the Charter, even though where it outlines the powers and duties of the Selectmen, it does say, um, nothing in this section shall be construed to authorize any member of the Board of Selectmen or a majority of such members to become involved in the day-to-day -day administration of any town department. So I'd just like your opinion on that or your comments on that, and how does that work? And we could start with Irfa. It goes back to what I was saying earlier, in that the various departments all have their own autonomy, and each department is, is tasked with its own function. And that that department is has to perform. They will report to the town manager, and they'll report to you know the various heads and, and the various other boards. But um, it's I mean it's it's a uh, it's a role of coordinating all the departments in town. Um, but not I mean when I say coordination, it's not mandating, it's not directing, it's allowing them to perform, but also kind of steering them into the right direction and, and coordinating with the others. Okay, uh, Patrick? Yeah, so I like that, uh, that charter. You know, you let the department do its own job. You know, the selectmen shouldn't be putting their hands in the mix on everything that goes on. That's why the people have voted for these, for a certain department, a certain planning board, and, and go figure. But, you know, selectmen should stay out of it. But, again, reel certain things in that need to be reeled in. You know, and take control just a little bit. When the final answer has to be made, that's when we would make the decision. But on the day-to-day -day activities, uh, the selectmen should not be sticking their hands into anything. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a very important clause, I think, in the charter that was first adopted in 2005, 2006, and then just revised here a year or two back, um, and left in there for good reason. In years past, uh, the selectmen, before we had a town manager form of government, the selectmen had an executive secretary that ran the community, but really the chairman of the board of selectmen was the boss in town. And uh, having served in that role, I mean, you can get really mired down in a lot of detail. So we are now a policy board, an appointing board, and a licensing board for the community. Those are our three key drivers, and a lot of things are around that. But those are the three key drivers. And we should not interfere with the day-to-day -day operations, uh, not only what the town manager does, and he reports directly to us, but to all the department heads that report into him, and certainly police and fire. Uh, we just had a meeting this evening, earlier before this debate, uh, specific to a question that came before the board about a, a parade permit. And we got into the weeds a little bit, and I got a little energized saying, you know, I have to run over to this debate here. Why are we in the middle of this? This is the police chief's responsibility. This is the fire chief's responsibility. It's not our responsibility to figure out where the cops are going to stand to maintain order during a road race. So sometimes we go down that path, and we have to pull ourselves back out of that and stay at the level that we belong at and where the charter dictates that we stay. Okay, Michelle, you have the next question. Okay, the next question is kind of re related to amount of knowledge required to serve on the Board of Selectmen, and uh, there are obviously varying levels of experience for all three candidates. Um, so the, I'm going to ask, how important is knowledge and participation, participation in local town government when running for the Board of Selectmen, and what do you do to stay up to date. So from the perspective of someone that's already served, you can answer it from that. And from someone who has not, what steps have you taken to come up to speed to learn about the town and what's happening to be able to effectively serve on the board? And we'll start off with Patrick. Well, like I said, uh, my education and experience, yeah, it's not town management, it's dealing with union contracts and negotiation. I think that's a skill 
that's also needed with the Board of Selectmen when you're dealing with contracts that are coming up, fire, police, and all that. So what I have done, because uh, I'm new to this, so catching up real quick, you know, talking to people, talking to residents, other business owners, and other committee members to try to bring me up to speed. You know, there's a lot going on, and, you know, it's a whirlwind of issues going on, so I'm just listening right now, taking notes, and learning as I go along. Okay. Brian? In my years of serving on the board, I have seen a selectman get elected new to the board uh, that come from other parts of town government and step right in and get going right away and are very effective. I have seen selectmen get elected to the board of selectmen that had zero experience in town government and step right in and maybe it's a month or two slower than some of their colleagues that are new at that time, but they also catch up and they do extremely well and they bring a lot of value to the community. So I've seen it from a couple of different angles when people come onto the board, uh, whether experience matters or not. I think life's experience truly matters. Hopkinton experience truly matters. And I think having a good business sense and a good people sense and understanding, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in empathy, understanding people's thoughts and feelings uh, in the world around us. And if I think that if they have those skills, I think they can be very effective as members of the board. Uh, what I do now uh, as a selectman to stay current with what's going on in town is I do a lot of stuff like this. I go to a lot of selectman meetings. Uh, I watch HCAM TV. I want to give a plug to HCAM. I do watch HCAM TV. Um, some of that music kills me late at night, but anyway, um, you know, there's a lot of ways you can stay informed, but I have five kids in town too, so I do a lot of that uh, interaction with Hopkinton by just being out with my kids and being at their games and being at their plays and recitals and everything else. Okay. Irfan? I think as far as skills and um, experience, um, my experience as an attorney in town and as, as a government attorney before that and an enforcement attorney before that. Um, that has given me the, the skills of facilitating uh, discussion, uh, as working as a problem solver, being able to resolve conflicts, being able to find, uh, sift through the extraneous issues and find the common ground is what really matters. I think those are skills that I could bring to the Board of Selectmen. Um, these, these are the skills that I've uh, developed in my professional experience, and these are things that I could bring to the Board. Um, as far as getting up to speed, well, I've been working with the, with the planning board for the past year, so I am familiar with a number of those, uh, number of those issues. Um, I've also been attending some of the Chambers of Commerce meetings and, um, and the Board of Selectmen meetings to uh, get up to speed. And fortunately, we have uh, HCAM. We have a number of resources in, in town, uh, the EHOP, where we can, uh, fabulous resources to uh, kind of get up to speed as to what's going on in town. And Michelle? And uh, Michelle, I believe you had a follow-up. Um, I do have one more question, and it was, uh, could you talk about your track record of attending annual town meeting during your time here in Hoppington? And we'll start off with Brian for this one. I don't think I have missed an annual town meeting since I moved to town. Uh, if I did, it would have been way back before I was necessarily involved at this level. Uh, I know I hobbled in last year on my crutches and my cast and my uh, ibuprofen to sit through it, but um, I think I've been to all of them. I don't think I've ever missed one. Patrick? So I have not been to town meeting since I moved into town. Going on my fifth year now, uh, the first three years of moving into town, I worked in Boston, so you know I had the long commute over 100 miles a day. Um, I went to law school at night, so there were a lot of a lot of things going on in my personal life with work and school and um, just getting adjusted to town and took, you know, slow roll to get involved. Okay. Irfan? Well, I moved here in 81 as a child, so I didn't attend town meeting at that point. <laughs> um, but since I came back as an adult, um, moved back in uh, 2013 in August, I attended my first one the following year, and I've, uh, I've attended town meeting since. Okay. Excellent. All right, we have uh, a couple yes or no questions. It's just a simple yes or no answer. And uh, for each question, we'll just start with Brian and go around the table. Uh, the first question is, will you vote to support the turf fields project, yes or no? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. OK. Do you support <laughs> opting out and preventing recreational pot establishments in Hopkinton, yes or no? Yes. Yes. That's not a yes or no question. <laughs> I think that there's uh, there's more to it. Um, 
frankly, I would I would opt out at this point, but I believe that a commission should be set up to study the uh, the, the pros and cons of recreational marijuana. I think that um, allowing recreational marijuana without any kind of regulation or any kind of study would be uh, would be uh, would not be the right course. Uh, so I would vote yes, but I would want to see a commission uh, appointed in order to examine the, uh, the pros and cons. Tom, I have a view on that. Sure. Um, I think it's been studied to death. The whole concept of recreational marijuana in America has been studied forever, and that's why we have it sort of evolving into different states around the country. I think there's plenty of studies out there. I think the biggest study that Hopkinton underwent was when the referendum was on the ballot, or the question was on the ballot a couple of years ago, and Hopkinton clearly said no. That's the all the study I need. If I could respond to that, I think uh, Hopkinton certainly said no, but there has been no uh, research, there's been no uh, commission really set up to look at what are the benefits. We've had a knee-jerk reaction to, to recreational marijuana where we're banning even laboratory testing. Um, I, I mean, and, and the basis for that is it's going to set an example, uh, and I don't see how having a laboratory testing facility is setting any kind of example except that uh, business, We're letting a lab do its business. So you're suggesting there's been no studies of recreational marijuana in Massachusetts or the United States? No, I'm suggesting that we haven't had a thorough study in Hopkinton. Why would Hopkinton be any different than the United States or Massachusetts? Well, if you want to look at the rest of the country, there's been examples where it's been successful, and I think that uh, Hopkinton can follow, certainly follow those roles. We need to look at what are the other options out there, what are the other models out there that would fit better for Hopkinton. So I think your definition of successful is probably what's, at, at, at what's being discussed here then. So my definition of successful when it comes to recreational marijuana and yours is probably different, but I think it's been studied to death, and I don't want to waste any time in Hopkinton creating another study, I think the residents of Hopkinton need to get to it and take a vote. Okay. Well, uh, uh, sorry to cut you off, but Michelle, you had a follow-up? I, I just wanted to, all right, so Brian was yes, Patrick was yes. Irfan, I just want to ask again because you originally said it's not a yes or no question, and I understand your follow-up, but it is on the town meeting, you know, it's, it's a warrant article, and you're going to be asked to vote yes or no. So in that case, it is a yes or no, right? It is, but... So which way will you... And my point is, we don't need to study it anymore. Let's take the vote, yes or no. Well, we don't have an option. Of course we're going to take a vote. There, we can't say we can't vote. So yes, we are going to take a vote. I am going to vote yes, because I don't want to see, um, to see something come in. If we said no, and then something, uh, a facility comes in, we have no way of really regulating. We have to fall back to the state regulations. I would want to see how would we want to handle it as a town. That has not been looked at. Okay. All right, I think that's enough on that question. We'll move on to our next yes or no question, or yes or no, or maybe a yes or no question. <laughs> uh, will you vote to support funding for undergrounding utilities as part of the Main Street Corridor project? Uh, let's see if we can keep this one, yes or no. We'll start off with Brian. Yes. Patrick. Uh, actually, uh, reading up on that, Working in uh, Verizon, I worked in that field, setting these telephone poles and all that. First, that was a, a no for it, oh, you don't need it. But after looking at the plan and understanding and seeing these poles on uh, Main Street and they have wood where they're actually in the breakdown lane, I think it's a, a safety issue and I would definitely vote yes to sink them. We're talking about just burying the, the poles? <laughs> yes. And did anyone else have a follow-up on that? Well, actually the question was, will you there, it's, it's a $3 million cost. So I guess what I'm asking, not just the polls, but the, the whole question that's out there is for, will you vote to support the $3 million for the undergrounding of utilities? Me first? Yes. Um, I would vote for um, putting the utilities underground, but I think it's part of a larger project um, that I would want to take a closer look at. Um, I think the, the, the bike trail, we need to take a look at the, you know, the bike trail, we need to look at the parking aspects of the whole downtown corridor project. But as far as burying the utilities, yes, I would vote for that. Okay. All right. And since you both uh, commented on uh, funding for undergrounding utilities, I'll allow Brian uh, to talk about uh, why or why not you would support uh, funding for undergrounding utilities 
as part of the Main Street Corridor project? Yeah, the Main Street Corridor project has been in, uh, on the books in Hopkinton. We've been tracking this and working towards this for about five years now. Uh, we've been talking about it for 20 years because the intersection has been a mess for 20, if not 40 years. Uh, so the intersection, you know, right in the middle, center of town, that's a big part of this. Undergrounding the wires is also another part of it. Uh, I do support spending the $3 million to underground the wires. I think it'll completely change the look and feel of downtown Hopkinton. It'll enhance the uh, uh, historic nature of downtown Hopkinton by taking all that clutter out of the view shed. Uh, so I'm a very strong proponent of doing so. Uh, in terms of the downtown quarter project itself, we're past 25%, headed to 75% design now. The parking issues have been resolved. We got an additional 17 spaces of parking back by putting the bike lanes into the right configuration based on state and federal guidelines. Uh, the state DOT is on board with that. So a lot of the issues have been resolved that came up in public hearings that we've had over the last several years. It's again, time to move this one forward and get it done. It's one of the primary reasons I'm running again this is a great opportunity for Hopkinton to put a really nice stamp on its face. It's downtown, and uh, we're almost there, so let's keep it going. All right, we're going to move on to closing statements now. Each of you will have uh, up to two minutes for a final closing statement, and we will start off with Patrick. All right, first I want to thank HCAM for hosting this uh, uh, debate tonight. I want to thank Irfan and Ryan for coming out and making this possible as well. New voice, change, fresh ideas. That seems to be the slogans that are going out there when I'm hitting the streets, talking to uh, the residents of this town, talking to business owners, talking to fire, talking to police people. It's new change in ideas, and that's what I would bring. My experience as a union negotiator and uh, my education and hopefully passion the bar soon becoming a lawyer, uh, I would bring a different look to the selectmen. You know, not everybody has to be a CEO of a company. I think you need those different ideas, different approaches, and just different, just different, everything's different. So uh, bringing fresh ideas. I've been uh, part of this town for five years. Uh, I just built a house in town. I'm here to stay. Uh, I like the small town culture feel that this place has. Uh, I'm from the city, but coming here, you know, I would never leave now. This is my home, and I'm happy to call it home. Okay. Brian? Thank you both for having us tonight, uh, and to HCAM for sponsoring as well. Uh, it's always good to be here and talking about the issues that affect the town. Uh, I enjoy this kind of dialogue. Uh, I thought tonight was like, kind of like a selectman meeting. We went back and forth a little bit. That's good. That's healthy. That's what it needs to be. Uh, and I think we do it in a way that's respectful and uh, productive for the entire community. So uh, hopefully that will continue with whoever gets elected. Uh, you know, Hopkinton's uh, a great community. It's a wonderful community. I've raised my five kids here, and I've spent a lot of time in local government here. And uh, we've got a transition year going on with a lot of folks stepping off the school committee. A bunch, a couple of people could possibly step off the board of selectmen. And there's a there's a, a, a concern about the knowledge base and the historical perspective that people could bring to meetings and to decision making in town. And uh, I'm running for this fourth and final term to offer that experience and historical perspective. And uh, with the support of the residents of Hopkinton, uh, I'd be happy and honored to serve that fourth and final term. And I'd appreciate your vote on Monday, uh, May 21st. Thank you. Okay, Irfan. You know, when it comes to government, it's local government that really impacts uh, a person's daily life, from schools, fire department, police, uh, even snow plowing. It is local government that impacts us on a daily basis. Um, so I've been receiving, and I really want to give back, particularly want to, you know, go back to a point, a sad point in my life when my father was uh, nearing his end. And we received the support of the fire department and police department coming in the middle of the night, not only helping my dad, but helping us as individuals. That's something I'm going to be forever grateful for, and I want to really give back to my community. You know, the town is, um, is faced with a number of challenges, um, a number of the issues that we've already gone over uh, here tonight. And I think that my skills as a, as a problem solver, uh, my skills as an attorney, and uh, everything that comes with that would help to bring everyone, to, uh, help to bring, those, uh, bring a solution to some of these issues, or at least assist. Um, the town is also facing a number of issues with regard to growth and the new face. And what I really want to do is I want to bring all the new faces together uh, so that we can all share in this wonderful community. 
I really want to thank both Brian and Patrick for being here tonight, and as well as for HCAM. Um, it's been fantastic uh, talking to both of you, and uh, great meeting both of you th throughout this whole campaign. Um, I feel as though I've made some friends here, and uh, I think at the end of the day, we, we're all neighbors. So no matter how this turns out, we're going to be good. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. That will do it for tonight's contested races debate. I would like to thank all the candidates who joined us as well as, our, in, as well as in our studio and at home viewers. The HCAM staff and crew, our panelists from the Hopkinton Independent, Michelle Murdoch and Jim Kleinkoff, and everyone who helped put together tonight's debate. The polls are open 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. Monday, May 21st. All Hopkinton precincts vote at the Hopkinton Middle School Brown Gymnasium. Don't forget to get out and vote. We hope that this program helped get you ready for the election for all of us at HCAM. I'm Tom Nappy. Thank you for watching and have a good night.